We live in a time of extinction. As hundreds of amphibians, birds, mammals, and plants vanish from the planet, apocalyptic thinkers are speculating that Homo sapiens might be next. But I'd like to try to move past that apocalyptic thinking today um, and, and also suggest that we're at a different historical moment than the 1950s. So if, if in the 1950s uh, people thought that the human species had the capacity to destroy all life on Earth, I think that's probably unlikely at the current historical moment. There's, um, it was once thought, for example, when Hannah Arendt wrote The Human Condition, that nuclear war might bring on this nuclear winter and all life on Earth would die. Um, but if you talk to microbiologists today, they, they tell you about these microbes that have been entombed under the Earth for some 30,000 years, 50,000 years, and they've studied these periodic reseeding events. So a planet that is devoid of human life and the forms of life that we love, like mammals and plants and birds, would likely be something like a blank petri dish, fresh for reseeding with other forms of life. So, so against that backdrop of a potentially bleak future where we've killed ourselves and the ones we love, I, I've got to ask, and, and for me this is something of an open question right now, um, is, is the human species a tragic figure? Um, you know, we've all seen Shakespearean dramas, we can see character flaws in Hamlet, um, and we, we can see flaws in, in our own um, political and economic systems right now. Uh, we can see flaws in, inherent in some of our technologies. But, but the question is, can, can we recognize those flaws and, and, and change course? So, so in exploring this question of hope today in an era of extinction, we must ask hope for whom? Our panelists today are, are some of the foremost thinkers on, on the subject of extinction. And have, many of them have worked to give presence to imperiled organisms that are often beyond the pale of um, you know, the, the, the normal cultural worlds that, that um, popular society inhabits. So we're, we're all aware of charismatic animals like pandas, tigers, and elephants that can capture our imagination. These kinds of creatures sometimes become objects of control in the name of conservation, and the lives of individual, individual animals are often caught in the crosshairs of conflicting human desires. As my Australian colleagues Tom Van Doren and Deborah Bird Rose remind us, there are also many unloved others, the ones that are disregarded, those who might be lost through ne negligence. There are also disliked and ac actively vilified others, those that might be specifically targeted for death. What hope could there possibly be for these who are less visible, for those that are less beautiful, that are less part of our cultural lives? And, and I think some of the art you see on the walls here is, is trying to open up that question of, of you know, it, uh, conventional aesthetics are, are um, more complicated in some of these artworks. You see, for example, um, uh, Susan's work right here on diatoms and, and, and fungi right next to more charismatic species like the blue-winged teal. So following another Australian colleague, Matthew Churlew, I propose that one question we might explore today is who to love in an era of extinction, and also how to love, how to care. So before we get started today, um, I, I have a lot of thank yous. For starters, uh, uh, Thomas Barron and, and, uh, and his family for endowing the Barron Visiting Professorship, which has allowed me to be here at Princeton this year. Also, the amazing team at, at PEI, the Princeton Environmental Institute, Raj, Laura, Igor, Holly, Angela, and Kathy have made this event happen. Um, Matthew and Robin at Butler College opened up this gallery space to us. And uh, the students in my freshman seminar who are sitting in the back are, are the curators who brought this art into the gallery. We've been together three weeks and they've already put together this amazing show. Um, so I, I expected, like in the syllabus it said you have to bring one piece of art to the show being Princeton students, they each pick three, and we're not talking like simple pieces, we're talking like multimedia installations and things that grow, so I'm very impressed by my students. Um, so, so today, Carrie's gonna start off uh, the event with a short talk, uh, Curating Life and Death, the case, case of the Passenger Pigeon. So, so the panelists are currently sitting in the audience. After Carrie's talk, I'm gonna ask everyone to come up front, and, and the aim is to have this interdisciplinary dialogue, exploring a series of questions. Can ongoing ecological catastrophes be stemmed or reversed with technological or scientific interventions? 
if it is technically possible, should woolly mammoths and passenger pigeons be reanimated? And, and we've got some people on the line who actually are experimenting with some of these uh, tools of molecular biology to, to make that happen. Should unloved animals like ticks and mosquitoes be edited out of ecosystems? It's, it's now becoming technically possible to do things like that, too. Again, who should we love in this time of extinction? What practices of care can keep those who we love in the world? So without further ado, Carrie Wolf. Okay. Thanks, Evan, for uh, inviting me. I'm going to try to make this reasonably quick because I'm actually a lot more interested in what the other panelists have to say than in what I have to say. So I'm going to um, talk about uh, uh, one contemporary art installation today that focuses on, uh, on the question of extinction. And I want to uh, sort of just begin by suggesting that it's difficult to generalize, I think, about extinction. And it's, and it's even difficult to generalize about it when we limit ourselves to the class of creatures called birds. As we'll see now in Michael Pestel's remarkable installation, Requiem, Ectopistus Migratorius, which was mounted at Lafayette College in the fall of 2014, which centers on the passenger pigeon, the centennial of whose extinction the installation memorializes, but also the specter of a single bird, Martha, next slide please, the last of her kind, who died in a uh, <coughs> excuse me? Who died in a display in the Cincinnati Zoo on September 1st, 1914? Now, in a longer discussion, there would be much to say about this curious fact, namely dating the extinction of an entire species to a particular day. But I'll begin by noting that the centrality of Martha marks the extinction event of this particular species and Pestle's installation is qualitatively something quite different from what we find in other extinction stories of bird species. At the center of his, of his complex installation is a large round wooden structure called Martha's Peel, the term peel referring here not to a covering or its removal, but to, a, to small square defensive towers of the sort that were built in the 16th century in the border counties of England and Scotland. Next slide, please. Here mimicked by the 12 feet high by 8 feet diameter wooden structure resembling a large bird cage with a rotating stool at its center and a video camera mounted on top to record the activities of those who inhabit the structure. Martha's Peel is paired with two other components that stand across from it. Passenger is a wooden train trestle of about 20 feet long, supporting a modified O-scale train car that moves back and forth across its length, casting a shadow both inside and outside the trestle. Next slide, please. And viewers are invited to sight down the length of the trestle as the train moves. Peel's foe consists of a long palindrome that also sits above the train trestle. Next slide, please. Inscribed on slate panels, reading, Peel's foe, not a set animal, laminates a tone of sleep. Pestle has long been fascinated with palindromes, anagrams, and so on. These elements reference two of the three main factors, <coughs> excuse me, two of the three main factors that contributed to the passenger pigeon's extinction, the rifle and the railroad, which are alluded to not just by the O-scale train, but also by the viewer sighting down the interior of the train trestle as down the barrel of a gun. The role of the rifle will be clear enough in a moment, but the railroad played a major factor in transporting large hordes of hunters to the migratory roosting sites, and crucially with the invention of refrigerated cars, which allowed the transportation of fresh squab meat, as it was called, to urban centers. The third main factor in the pigeon's demise, the invention of the telegraph, allowed masses of hunters to be alerted as to roosting locations. And the telegraph, and specific its iter specifically its iterability, is linked in the exhibition to writing, to pecking, to musical notation, and of course the iterability of birdsong itself in numerous ways, and I'll list some of them now. Flugel, catalog of extinct birds, a cluster of elements including a grand piano, a musical composition that algorithmically translates the Latin names of almost 200 species of extinct birds into corresponding musical phrases, and a large collection of piano cluster boards, or PCBs, which use spaced out wooden dowels that, when placed directly down on the keys, automatically play the corresponding musical phrases. Next, next slide, please. Right, there the PCBs are in the lower left-hand corner of the, of the slide. An element called erasure, next slide, 
which consists of a, which, of a video of the names of extinct birds being written on a chalkboard and then erased, which is shown on a small video screen mounted above Martha's Peel that can only be viewed through bird watching binoculars. Next slide. You can see it way up in the corner beyond the peel. <coughs> and three piano harps. Next slide. One of which incorporates a 1914 Oliver typewriter. Next slide, please. As part of the instrumentation that viewers are invited to play to generate a sound field for a looping video of a dancing bird called Pigeon 98. Next slide. And clearly, next slide, the shape of the piano harps and the shape of the typewriter mechanism itself. Next slide. Recall the wings of a bird. In the rows of letters mounted on the glass wall at the entrance of the exhibition, what I'll, which I'll come back to more in detail later. Next slide. And finally, in the performances of Pestle himself at various times during the exhibition, which include improvisations on a large handmade wooden recorder about this tall called the Bird Machine that incorporates a row of various bird calls mounted out to the side and on a flute that fires wadding of the sort used in musket loading rifles into a gong mounted on one of the piano harps to punctuate the performance. Next slide, please. So what Michael does to start the, it's, it's wild, he's actually trained as a musician, he's done a lot of improvisational work. So he starts by swinging this thing around that's made of rubber bands and it makes this kind of woo 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 And then he starts playing all these sort of bird noises on this recorder like woo 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 And then he goes over here and does the bird calls and then comes back and plays the recorder. And then later he plays the flute and there's some wadding in the flute and at the end of the, the flute performance, he blows really hard into it and it shoots this wadding out and hits that gong. <laughs> and that's how the show opens. So there's a lot going on, okay? All right, so what we find in the exhibition then is a complicated conjugation of the relationship between time, space, and how those are related to questions of code, of iterability, <coughs> technology, notation, the disposition and articulation of the body, and performance and performativity all of which is in turn framed by the complicated relationship between singularity and multiplicity that structures the entire story of the extinction of the passenger pigeon, not least of all in the poignant contrast between the singularity of Martha, the palsied 29-year-old sterile sole survivor of her kind, and what the species itself was most known for, flocks that, according to the estimate of none other than John James Audubon, could number over a billion birds and were said to darken the skies for days at a time. As Anita Albus recounts Audubon's experience in her beautiful book on rare birds, and I'm quoting her now and she'll quote Audubon as well in this passage, <coughs> not one pigeon would land unless some of their millions of fiery red eyes could spy some woods with beech mast or acorns or fields of wheat or rice for their millions of pitch black bills. If a falcon tried to seize a bird in the flock, the pigeons quickly closed ranks into a compact mass, generating a roll of thunder with their beating wings. Like a living torrent, they plunged down in almost solid masses and, as Audubon writes, darted forward in undulating and angular lines, descended and swept close over the earth with inconceivable velocity, mounted perpendicularly so as to resemble a vast column and when high were seen wheeling and twisting with their continued lines, which then resembled the coils of a gigantic serpent." Unquote. She continues, moved by the beauty of the spectacle, this painter of birds observed how one flock after the other would fly into the space where a pigeon had just escaped a falcon's talon, and how, even if no raptor were present, they would form a living river in the air and replicate the angles, curves, and undulations of the attacked flock before them. A single memory bonded millions of pigeons together." Unquote. I'll come back later briefly to the theoretical register of this swarm-like behavior, but it should be noted that, practically speaking, this strategy of what's called predator satiation is precisely what enabled the passenger pigeon's rapid demise once all the necessary technological ingredients were in place. In his ornithological biography, Audubon recounts the various strategies employed to produce the mass carnage that led to the passenger pigeon's extinction. Various sorts of firearms were used, of course, but also large pole and net contraptions that would garner thousands of birds at a time. Sulfur pots generated fumes that would asphyxiate birds by the thousands, 
Trees were felled as tens of thousands of nests and nestlings fell to the ground, and birds were poisoned with whiskey-soaked corn so that they could be rounded up easily, just to name some of the more tried and true strategies. Some Native Americans who had partaken of pigeon flesh as part of their subsistence for years found these methods disturbing, to say the least. Potawatomi leader Pokagon, disgusted by one 1880 massacre he had witnessed, wondered about what sort of punishment in the afterlife would be, quote, awaiting our white neighbors who have so wantonly butchered and driven from our forests these wild pigeons, the most beautiful flowers of the animal creation of North America, unquote. Both of these, the scene of slaughter and the moral indignation, are depicted in a famous scene in James Fenimore Cooper's The Pioneers, published in 1823, a novel that is a call to judgment, as Jerome McGann has recently argued, about the treatment of, quote, other species, other native people, other nations, rec recorded in Cooper's work. As the massive flocks of passenger pigeons descend upon the town of Templeton, the people of the village are whipped into a frenzy, and along with the poles and nets, every species of firearms is deployed. But the most significant of these is an old small swivel cannon, once used in the in to make inroads into the Indian settlements, as Cooper puts it, later deployed for patri patriotic ceremonies such as Fourth of July celebrations, but now filled with duck shot and fired into the passing columns of pigeons. As Leatherstocking observes the scene, he is, quote, able to keep his sentiments to himself until he saw the introduction of the swivel into the sports. But then he objects, it's wicked to be shooting into flocks in this wasty manner, to kill 20 and eat one. When I want such a thing, I go into the woods until I find one to my liking, and then I shoot him off the branches without touching the feather of another, though there may be a hundred on the same tree, unquote. In the meantime, he says, taking his leave, quoting again, I wouldn't touch one of the harmless things that cover the ground here, looking up with their eyes on me as if they only wanted tongues to say their thoughts." Unquote. Now much could be said <coughs> about all the various ethical and political dimensions of this scene, not least of all the use of the patriotic cannon to clear both Indian and Indians and pigeons, but one of the things that Leatherstocking's response draws our attention to is the difference between multiplicity and singularity that frames the entire story of the passenger pigeon, and more importantly, the contrasting ways of relating to that difference bodied forth in the use of the patriotic cannon against the flocks, or so-called primitive hordes, so numerous that they are more like a swarm of insects, versus Leatherstocking's thoughts of having his gaze returned by the individual bird looking up at me with their eyes. Now this image of the birds as a kind of superorganism or a swarm is an easy mark, I take it, for any armchair reader of Deleuze, but I want to return now to the installation and specifically to Martha and ask, what resides at the other pole of this configuration, the pole of singularity? What is Martha exactly? A pet? A fetish? A curiosity? A relic? We might say that her captivity, her display, and the giving to her of a proper name all attempt to turn her into all of these things. But these compensatory gestures only underscore all the more that this is a case of fetishistic disavowal not so much of our own grotesque role in the extinction of our species, perhaps, but also of our own finitude in relation to other forms of life, which calls forth these compensatory gestures to, cur gestures to curate, you might say, the boundaries between life and death, survival and extinction, all of which is indexed, it seems to me, by the strange fact of giving it an exact date to the extinction of her species. But in a much more real sense, of course, the passenger pigeon, considered as, as a complex of system environment interactions that evolve over time versus the simplex of the brute material persistence of her body and her DNA, was already extinct before Martha died. And our, and our exertion of curatorial power over the life-death boundary on the site of extinction, even to the point of dating it by our calendar and our archive, is driven by the same thing that drives Martha's name, as it turns out. Martha, who was in fact named for George Washington's young widow, her mate George, who died a year earlier, named for the president himself, the epitome of sovereignty itself for the young nation, if ever there was one. But the whole point, of course, <coughs> is that the passenger pigeon is neither beast nor sovereign, as Derrida would put it, and all of this, in my view, is outed, as it were, in Martha's Peel, where we're invited to sit and spin around inside the cage 
vocalize or play an instrument in memory of Martha's bird song and draw on the chalkboard floor as Martha would have rubbed her beak on a chalk block inside her cage while as we spin, next image please, photographic stills, oh I'm sorry, yeah go back, go back, uh, go back, go back, go back, there. Uh, while as we spin, <coughs> photographic Photographic images from Edward Mybridge's famous series of, of the passenger pigeon whizzed by, perhaps quickly enough to show the bird in flight, creating a kind of spectral reanimation. Next slide, please. Is this a process of becoming bird, as the title of the live video projection of the inside of Martha's Peel suggests? No, nothing could be farther from the truth, I think, because the point is that the birds are already gone already part of a historical record archived by Mybridge's photographs. We are, to be sure, invited to occupy Martha's space, perhaps to identify with her singularity and isolation by having our attention riveted on our own. We are, in short, invited to open the question of the relationship between her finitude, her death, and our own. But in the end, I think, we're back to the question of dwelling, to what constitutes a proper or appropriate form of dwelling, and for whom, with whom, Back, in fact, to Leatherstocking's protest, put an end, judge, to your clearings. We're back, that is to say, to dwelling and specifically its relation to the eco of ecology via the oikos that links it to the eco of economy. The oikos that marks off and delineates a home, inside from outside, as a place where the relation between organism and environment is stabilized, secured, even made calculable and economizable. If the eco of ecology is fatefully linked, as Michael Martyr puts it, to quote, the oikos belonging to the family and standing for property, the proper, domus, one's own domain, unquote, then the challenge here is how to think an aneconomic or anti-economic sense of a proper or appropriate dwelling, one divorced from property, the family, and the proper name, such as, for example, Martha, and finally, from sovereignty itself. Part of the conceptual <clears throat> an emotional torque of the piece, in other words, is the irony of Martha's final dwelling, which testifies all the more to the necessity of thinking dwelling otherwise, perhaps as a migratory process, not a process of clearing, as precisely passengers, as we who are passing through, like the passenger pigeon whose name derives from the French passager, those who are passing by, or what Derrida calls in his second set of the seminars on the beast and the sovereign, a movement without repose. This complex nexus of temporality, dwelling, iterability, and materialization is put very much on the front burner in other elements in the installation. In the component, Eight Voices Before Columbus, next slide please, <coughs> which references the name for the passenger pigeon used by the Lenape, Ojibwe, Kaskaskia, Mohawk, Choctaw, Seneca, and Narragansett Indians, Next slide, where viewers are invited to drop an acorn, a key food source for the pigeon, into the podium after reciting the name of an extinct bird species, which takes us back, of course, to our discussion of Cooper's The Pioneers. And most of all, in the component called Unveiling, next slide, uh, the glass wall entrance to the gallery on which are printed letters that turn out to be fragments of the mitochondrial genome sequence of the passenger pigeon, supplied by Ben Novak, who some of you may know, uh, who is working with the Long Now Foundation in, in its revive and restore program to, to bring back the passenger pigeon as part of a larger de-extinction project. The complexities of the de-extinction process, let alone the debates about its viability and ethics, are far too detailed to go into here, but even its proponents realize that, in contrast to magically going backwards in time via genetics, a time loop that's related in a very interesting way to the palindrome of Peel's foe, there are other slower and more multidimensional temporalities at work here in the environmental factors affecting morphology and development, in the processes of imprinting, social learning and communication, and much else besides. In other words, as Christopher Johnson puts it, quote, code is both regulating before but also regulated after in the sense that the program is executed in a context that's perpetually changing, unquote. And what this means is that DNA is, quote, a relational determined part of a whole developmental system, unquote, as so much recent work in epigenetics has, has emphasized. 
The danger inherent in this new script of life, to borrow Julian Murphy's term in relation to extinction efforts, <coughs> is quote, I'm quoting him now, is that it has nothing to do with the molar form or representational shape of the creature and everything to do with parcelized units of production on the one hand and strings of mappable code on the other. Two correlated models of futurity, he continues, are implicit in this new script. The implicit eternity of the market and the promise of species revival, whose innermost impulse is simply the infinite manipulability of life itself, unquote. That is to say, in the terms you, we used earlier, curatorial control over what Derrida calls the life-death relation. This question is certainly in play in Pestel's wall of genetic code, and there's also much to be said about glass and windows, both the architectural innovation and the operating system of a computer in relation to processes of visualization and capture that I can't go into here. But I'd like to see in Pestel's unveiling an agnostic, if not indeed cautionary note in this regard, one that reaches back, and I can't make the argument here for lack of time, next slide please, <coughs> to Marcel Duchamp's concept of delay at work in his famous piece, The Large Glass, The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelors, which is alluded to in Mel Chen's early piece, next slide, Bird in a Cage, which is in fact a portrait on glass of Martha and explicitly references Duchamp's concept of delay with Martha, of course, in the position of the bride. Think back to Martha and George. Pestle's glass, in other words, holds out to us the, pro the prospect that the passenger pigeon may yet live again, that we can somehow undo what we've done, and yet cautions us not to look at the species or Martha through a shop window that too readily links genetic code, market, time, and what we call life. And in its foregrounding of time-based performance and improvisation, the installation itself is in fact neither a code nor a script, I would suggest, but rather, as Derrida I might put it, a space in which what those scripts can produce is as promising and unpredictable, for better and for worse, as life and death itself. Thank you. to the front. So, so I'd like to uh, uh, bring, uh, uh, you know, these, these people who are joining us virtually, uh, Beth Shapiro from UC Santa Cruz, as well as Kevin Esvelt from MIT in, into the room. Um, seated to my left, we have uh, Janice Sotikoff, who's come down from Rutgers. Ashley Dawson, who participated in a similar event with me, uh, when was it? Wednesday of last Wednesday. week at, at the CUNY Graduate Center in, in New York. Ashley has a freshly published book. Um, Basically, all the people up here have written books or major articles on, on the issue of, of extinction. Um, and they're also listed on our website. Uh, Maria Whiteman has uh, video installations as, as well as uh, photographic installations here in the gallery grappling with um, issues of extinction. Uh, David Wilkov has written um, a number of influential books on the subject. Uh, Graham, where's Graham? <laughs> Graham is right there. Uh, do we have a seat for you, Graham? I'm running out. <laughs> All right, Graham, Graham's participating from, from the audience, uh, who written about whales, amongst other things. And uh, to, to get the conversation started, I was wondering if um, Beth might uh, st start off by just sort of bringing us up to speed with where we stand in, in relation to the tools of molecular biology, how some of the issues that Carrie was talking about in, in sort of the more aesthetic and philosophical realms are, are playing out um, in, in the realm of, of the biological sciences. unmute myself before I start talking. Uh, uh, that's very vague. <laughs> and I could talk for a very long time about these things, um, but I won't. Uh, basically, there are, just to talk about the technical strategies to bringing an extinct species back to life, um, there are basically three routes, three avenues that people are considering for this. Um, the first is, is backbreeding. This is the idea that there are uh, traits that characterize these extinct species that are still sticking around in living organisms and that through 
selective breeding, you can concentrate these traits into a single individual. The, the species project that comes to mind when thinking about backbreeding is the, the project in Europe to recreate an aurochs, which is the ancestor of domestic cattle, by looking for the traits that characterized aurochs, large, aggressive animals with forward-facing horns, in existing cattle breeds, and then selectively breeding these together, choosing offspring with those characteristics to bring forward. So that's, that's one approach. The second approach is, is cloning, and by cloning, people are generally referring to a specific scientific technique called somatic cell nuclear transfer, where you take a living cell, a somatic cell, so not a germ cell, not sperm or eggs, but a, a regular somatic cell, like a skin cell, or a, a liver cell, etc., and you fuse that cell with an egg from a closely related species that has had its own genetic material removed, and by sticking these the somatic cell, the preserved cell from the extinct species, together with this egg cell, you burst the membranes, insert the genetic material from the extinct species cell into this enucleated egg cell, which begins the process of embryogenesis. And then that should be implanted into a surrogate maternal host for, uh, for, for bringing that animal to term. Um, the challenge with this approach is that uh, skin's energetic material, uh, sorry, cells, energetic material within them, degrades pretty quickly after death. And so this is actually only feasible if tissues were taken and frozen prior to the death of the last remaining animal. The, the species that comes to mind when thinking about cloning is the Bucardo. This is a subspecies of Spanish ibex that uh, lives in the Pyrenees. And researchers were able to capture the last living individual, an elderly female named Celia, before she died, and harvest some tissue scale cells, skin cells from an ear. And they later used the cells, which they cultured in a dish and then froze in a cloning experiment using a hybrid domestic goat and ibex as a surrogate maternal host. Uh, Bucardo was in fact born following that experiment, but it had a, a major lung deformity and it died within about 10 minutes of being born. Um, the lung deformity uh, is not necessarily because of the cloning process, um, but it is unknown what, what caused that. Uh, the final method, probably the more, most likely method to bring an extinct species back to life is genome editing or genetic engineering. Um, this brings together advances both in ancient DNA where we can now extract enough information from the remains of extinct species to piece together complete genome sequences from these extinct species. And from that, we can compare the DNA sequences of a whole bunch of mammoths, for example, with DNA sequences from Asian elephants, which are only about one and a half uh, million places, sites in the nuclear genome different from each other. The, the Asian elephant and the mammoth merge from each other only about three to five million years ago. So their genomes are about 98% identical to each other. Then what one would do is identify the regions of the genome where the two species are different from each other and use gene editing technologies like CRISPR, this technology that we hear a lot about these days, to cut and paste our way from an elephant genome in a cell in a dish to a genome that is a little bit more mammoth-like. And then you could use that living cell for somatic cell nuclear transfer, standard cloning, to bring that animal to life. Um, that, uh, the status of that, there's a, there's a team in North Church's lab at Harvard that have so far replaced 14 different genes in the Asian elephant genome with a mammoth version of those genes. They have those cells growing in addition, a lab, they're trying to work on experiments right now to see if those genetic changes actually resulted in some phenotypic change. Um, so that is pretty much the status of the technology just for phase one, is it possible to bring an extinct species back to life? There are, of course, um, ethical and ecological and technical challenges associated with all of these, but uh, I believe you just asked me to talk about those, which is really my, my expertise at the moment. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. And, and with that, I, I might invite Ashley and Jim to talk about the issues of ethics. And, and you know, if, if, as it becomes increasingly technologically possible to, to do these sorts of things, should, should they be done? Should extinct species be brought back in one form or another? Or are there ever cases where things should be made extinct? Uh, uh, one of the th I really appreciated Carrie's remarks, uh, particularly uh, in terms of what it is we're even talking about. And I think 
I think we really lack um, language that's sensitive enough to this. When we're trying to replicate a genotype, it, what does that have to do at all with a species? What does that have to do at all with, with um, the sort of uh, ongoing uh, uh, reproductive history through generations of a creature that's attuned itself in multiple ways to the habitat around it, something I'm beginning to call heteroreciprocity. Um, and then just, just grabbing that and saying, okay, here's this thing we can, we can manipulate. So I don't even think we're talking about reconstituting species. I think we're, re we're reconstituting a genotype. And then I think the other thing is, is we've messed with this stuff a lot when we domesticate animals, but the idea that we would take the, all of the sort of living arc and begin to play with it as if all of it it, uh, we could take responsibility in the way that really you're required to be responsible when you take an animal under your tutelage, so to speak, genetically. Uh, I see all sorts of issues there. So what, what, I, what I'm most worried about right now is that we're running pell-mell ahead with all sorts of tools with very little capacity to talk about the subtleties in values and in reality that we're actually dealing with. And also adding to this is the fact that a lot of mechanistic and reductive notions of science keep us from even having the conversation we need to have where these other sorts of ways of thinking about the world show truths that, that unfortunately don't even appear to a lot of the people involved in this research. Um, <clears throat> well, in preparing tonight for tonight's conversation, I, I think I was most interested in the kind of most appealing case, actually. Um, in, in my book, Extinction, which, as you mentioned very kindly, is about to come out, I, I talk about the um, project that George Church is doing with woolly mammoths and also some of the passenger pigeon projects. And, and I have a critique of those. But in thinking about tonight, I, I think that um, this idea of um, genetically engineering mosquitoes so that you could either make them you know, 99% male or else so that you could make them resistant to the um, bacterium which spreads malaria it seems like one of the most compelling kinds of cases. I mean, 725,000 people die every year of malaria. Um, so mosquitoes arguably are one of the greatest weapons of mass destruction out there. Um, and of course, the Zika virus and its spread is very much in the public headlines and is um, creating very, very difficult situations in nations of the global south. But I still also, like Jim, worry about the implications of some of these steps. Um, quite a few scientists have talked about um, some of the possible drawbacks, some of the unpredictable ecological consequences of deploying uh, organisms that have been subjected to gene drive technology, for instance. Um, Mosquitoes might have new catastrophic capacities that we haven't yet imagined as a result of the complex interactions of genes and proteins and environments that result from manipulation. And of course, one of the other huge concerns of unleashing these kinds of organisms into the world is that the science that um, leads to their transformation could also get into um, ha the hands of people who want to use this in ways that are extremely deleterious. Um, so this. Um, there's a lot of concern, including on the part of the um, director of national intelligence, about which just classified um, these kinds of manipulation techniques as a weapon of mass destruction earlier this month about the implications of these technologies and about whether um, information should be released broadly so that human communities have a capacity to counteract possible damaging uses of the technologies or whether they should remain classified like nuclear weapons technology. Um, but for me, one of the big concerns is the kind of political economic context, right? I mean, the idea of curing malaria is extremely attractive, but why is that? Well, it has to do, I think, with the fact that absolutely nothing has been done by the people who have the capacity to do so, um, to, to cure malaria. Um, the Lancet released a report um, uh, quite recently saying that in the period from 1975 to 1979, only 1% of new therapeutic products have been developed um, for neglected diseases. And despite criticism of that fact, um, in the period that followed from 2000 to th 2011, only 4% of um, products were directed at um, uh, so-called neglected diseases like malaria. 
So there's a long history of basically ignoring the diseases that affect people of the global south. Why then the rush to find a cure using genetic modification technologies? Well, one could argue, oh, well, this is just finally what we've been looking for for so long. This is a great development. But I guess I worry about what I'm sort of calling the Trojan CRISPR. And that's the idea that, um, you know, it's not a conspiracy, but that by deploying CRISPR technology for these extremely you know, attractive and benevolent ends, we're kind of normalizing CRISPR technology in ways that are not just environmentally problematic, but also socially and politically problematic. And of course, the, the big issue here is um, genetic manipulation of human beings. Um, on February 1st, the United Kingdom's Fertility Regulatory Agency approved for the first time a researcher's request to use CRISPR gene editing <coughs> techniques to alter human embryos. So, you know, the, the, the kind of popularity and the moral appeal of changing mosquito genomes is not happening in some kind of value-free context, but rather within a context where capitalist corporations are pushing very, very hard to get regulatory regimes loosened up so they can begin to engage in these experiments that are likely to massively um, e expand differentials within human populations. People want to have designer babies. Who's going to get those designer babies? The people with the capital to do that. So <clears throat> I would just say that we need to be very cautious and think about the broader kind of political economic picture and about questions of, of social justice when we begin experimenting and potentially unleashing, unleashing these technologies into the world. Kevin, I was wondering if you wanted to talk about um, your, your research. Um, I, th I think probably some people here are, are less familiar with what a CRISPR Cas9 is or, or what a gene drive is. Do, do you want to sort of explain the, the, the sort of work that you're doing and um, the ways that gene drives might, might be used to, um, for example, uh, edit organisms out of ecosystems and uh, make, make a critter like, like the tick or the mosquito go extinct? So let me be able to tell you a little bit about my background. I played a very small role in the development of CRISPR technology itself, working with George Church. And I have the dubious distinction, perhaps fortune, perhaps misfortune, of being the first to realize that CRISPR could be used to build a gene drug. Now, when you use CRISPR to alter an organism, you can change, in effect, any DNA sequence within that organism, but only at a handful of different locations. And what that has pretty profound implications. It means that if you know what you want to change about the organism and you understand the DNA responsible for that trait, then you can at least have a chance at changing it. Now, if you're wrong, then you've just wasted your time. And you have to wait until you create that change and the organism grows up in order to find out if you're wrong. And that means that the applications are very limited depending on what organism you want to alter. Now, first. Let me emphasize that humans are very different from other organisms. So I think we need to put the question of altering the human germline using CRISPR in a very different box from the question of altering non-human organisms. In particular, I would argue that we are not going to use CRISPR to alter the human germline. We already have a perfectly good technology for doing that, and it's called in vitro fertilization with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. That solves 99.9% .9 of the avoiding genetic disease, and to get, to get to the earlier speaker's issue, with human enhancement as well. There is just no need for CRISPR. In fact, it would be highly unethical to use CRISPR because you only really need CRISPR if there is an allele that is not already present in the human population. And if there's an allele not already present in the human population, that means that we don't know what putting it in would do. And I would argue that that is unethical. So I would say let's put the human, human germline with CRISPR in a box and say that's a different issue that will probably be brought up by other non-CRISPR technologies. Then there's the application of CRISPR to alter organisms that are not humans. So it's an amazing tool for biotechnology. It accelerates everything we do by many fold. Just because it lets us edit any gene we want in any organism in which we can get DNA into the germline, that is into the cells that lead to sperm and egg production. But there's a major catch. Whenever we alter an organism, we reduce its ability to survive and reproduce in the wild. That's not an absolute rule, but it's pretty close to it because nature has been working 
to optimize organisms for reproduction in the ancestral habitat for many, many generations, working with population sizes much larger than anything that we can conceive of in the laboratory. And what that means is we're not going to beat nature at its own game of reproduction in the ancestral habitat. Yes, we can add herbicide resistance and then spray herbicide, and then that provides a fitness advantage in that area. But that's not the same as in the wild. The exception comes with what is called gene drive. So gene drive is a natural phenomenon in which a gene spreads through a population even if it doesn't benefit the organism. And the way this happens is there's a lot of different ways to accomplish it, but in a sense, the genetic element manages to find a way to replicate to some extent independent of the organism. One way to do that is to bias inheritance. So a normal gene in a sexual reproducing organism has a 50% chance of being inherited by any given offspring. Gene drive elements can increase this likelihood, in some cases up to nearly 100%. And so the outcome is that even a trait that is deleterious to the organism can still spread through a population. Now we didn't invent this. It's incredibly common in nature. It arose at least 100 million years ago possibly as much as a billion or more. And it's so common that there are gene drive elements, active or the broken remnants of them, present in the genomes of every species on Earth. This is not something new. But it is something that we can now harness for the first time. And with CRISPR, that means that we can edit more or less any gene we want in any organism that we can make transgenic. That last criterion is very important. It's very easy to make fruit flies transgenic. It is much harder to make mosquitoes transgenic. But with CRISPR, normally when we want to edit the organism, we just add the CRISPR system and then a copy of the edited version of the gene. CRISPR will cut the DNA at the site that we program, and the cell will repair the damage by inserting our edited copy. But what happens if you encode the CRISPR system next to the edited gene? So they go in together. Then when that organism reproduces, the offspring will inherit the edited gene and the CRISPR system. And if the other parent was a wild type, editing will happen again. That is, CRISPR will cut the wild type alle allele, the wild type version of the gene, and replace it with the edited version and the CRISPR system. So the organism goes from having one copy of the edited gene to two copies. And that means that all of its offspring are guaranteed to inherit a copy. And so the process will happen again. This allows us to spread a trait through a population. Very important caveats. One, organism has to be fast reproducing if you want this to be meaningful. So let's not worry about CRISPR gene drive in humans because you would have to wait hundreds, in fact, thousands of years for it to have a meaningful impact. And that assumes that future generations would not decide to undo it in the first place. Putting aside all of the ethical issues of using CRISPR on the germline, which again, I would say that given that there is no natural CRISPR system in the germline, it would be unethical to put CRISPR in there and make a gene drive. So no use on humans, no use on elephants or anything that reproduces very slowly. But mosquitoes reproduce very quickly. And we know how to make mosquitoes that can resist, say, malaria, that can resist chikungunya, dengue, Zika, although to date I would say that we don't know nearly enough about Zika to say that we should necessarily use something as drastic as a gene drive to fix the problem. We just don't know enough. But dengue and yellow fever, we know that's the same mosquitoes, and they kill 60,000 people a year. Maybe we should do something about that. And to the earlier point about, well, why now? Why haven't we been doing anything about malaria until now? It's true. We spend way more money trying to figure out a, a cure for cancer than we do on neglected tropical diseases. And that's a travesty. In fact, malaria is comparatively well-funded relative to something say, like, say, schistosomiasis. So that's something to keep in mind as well. There's a hierarchy even in the neglected tropical diseases. But at the end of the day, you're never getting rid of malaria the way we got rid of smallpox, which I would argue is one of the greatest achievements of, of humanity, was the eradication of smallpox. We drove the smallpox virus extinct. Now, this gets to the question of what is extinction really? Because the information of the smallpox virus is still on our computer servers. In fact, you can look it up. And that means that in the future, someone could, in fact, recreate it. It's also in a few freezers worldwide where we should probably get rid of it. 
But the information is not going away, and at some point that can be turned into physical reality again, and smallpox will live. As long as there are humans, that its host is available. So that might be a case where de-extinction would be a real thing, even in the context of the biological system. But back to gene drive. It cannot effectively be used as a weapon. I guarantee you, first of all, Dr. Director Clapper was not speaking of CRISPR gene drive in particular, he was speaking of CRISPR genome editing. Now, human enhancement might be a national security issue very far down the line. CRISPR-based editing of viruses and bacteria to accelerate bioweapons research may well be a national security issue right now. In fact, it most certainly is. CRISPR gene drive is not. And the reason is you cannot hide a CRISPR gene drive. If you sequence a population, if you sequence an individual organism, you will see any CRISPR gene drive that is present. It cannot be hidden because there is no such thing as CRISPR in the genomes of any sexually reproducing organism, naturally. It is just not there. You can even sequence an environmental sample and pick out a CRISPR gene drive because the instructions to make it work never occur naturally. So it's easy to if you bother to look at all. The detection method sequencing is dropping fat in cost faster than any other technology on the planet in the history of the world. And once you see something, you know how to build the counter. And that leads us to the most important thing about CRISPR gene drive, which is CRISPR lets you target any sequence. So you can target the sequence of an earlier gene drive and overwrite them. That is, overwrite whatever change was made. So in the case of an, a malevolent change, you overwrite that malevolent change, and you ensure that your gene drive cannot be overwritten itself, and will also spread through the wild population and protect it against the malevolent one. This is also a potential cleanup tool against not malevolent misuse, but just, so we say, genetic vandalism. So the widespread availability of the technology is definitely a concern. And what the technology will do for social trust in science, I detect that some skepticism that scientists can handle this technology responsibly. I fully agree. Right now, science is done largely in secret. Deliberately, there are systematic incentives for us to keep things secret, even if we are in academia. But now we're talking about a technology that can be used to unilaterally alter shared ecosystems. We're talking about something that will ignore national borders can be used to do tremendous good. In the time that I have been talking, on the order of six children have died of malaria. I think we can all agree that that's a bad thing and that we should do something to stop it. The only way that we can conceivably eradicate malaria is if with either a good vaccine, which we've been trying to get for decades with no success, or something like a gene drive. Is that for us to decide? Well, frankly, I don't see any, I haven't seen any African faces, pardon me, I can't see everyone present there. Since I don't see any African faces, I don't think it's any of our bloody business. We are not the ones who are affected by malaria, and we will not be the ones affected by any ecological disruptions. I can say as a matter of probably reasonably scientific judgment that it's fantastically unlikely that anything that does potentially go wrong in terms of ecological side effects would be worse than malaria, because the malaria is just that bad of a scourge. But what if you're talking about something closer to home? One of the problems, one of the reasons I'm very uncomfortable with the notion even of using a gene drive against malaria is because the ethical imperatives of deciding as a society, collectively, by everyone who will be affected, whether or not to go forwards, clash directly with the overwhelming imperative to do something to stop the terrible death toll. And what's more, we're talking about an intervention that where it's really hard to get what could reasonably be called informed consent in that region of the world, much less international agreement, and in the face of treaties that prohibit that sort of thing. So maybe we should start something on something closer to home. How about, say, Lyme disease? In that case, we might immunize the mice against Lyme disease, so they can't transmit it to ticks and then to us. Then that's something that could affect me. I have two children that like to play outside. I would rather that they not suffer that risk. And we can talk about it in a, among a population that is much more comparatively educated. So I just like to throw that out there, see what people think in terms of the potential different applications. 
I haven't really talked about the ecological conservation applications and whether we might want to use it to control invasive species or perhaps to protect bats before white-nosed fungus decimates them. But I figure that that's something that other speakers would want to talk about. I'd like to bring both uh, Janice and David into the conversation. So Janice, you've, you've written about the cultural lives of endangered species and, and um, some, you know, I think you can address some of the, the, the social justice issues. And, and David, you've, you've been working in, in conservation biology for, for decades now using more traditional policy-oriented methods and um, field methods. So I'd love to hear what you think of these, these new molecular uh, uh, techniques and ecological systems. And I'd, I'd, love to hear you respond to some of the things that have been said by the molecular biologists as well. Yes, thank you both. That was a fascinating update on the technology. I would say um, sort of in contrast to the ethical arguments against using, you know, genetic um, engineering to alter species, I would be supportive of it within certain uh, parameters. Uh, for example, the mosquito problem. I've read that of the 3,500 mosquito species there are, you could eradicate 100 species that are the carriers of the main infectious diseases and without altering ecosystems in any significant way. So that seems, yeah, <laughs> is that correct? Um, you really only need six at a minimum. Well, yeah, six at a minimum for no, no more malaria, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, and yellow fever. Um, possibly the big as many six. as 10 to get rid of, to really get rid of malaria, depending on how the others work. Um, I'm not gonna say anything about ecological side effects because we just don't know. We don't know, um, but given, yeah, well, some people believe, some scientists believe there wouldn't be any significant effect and I would have to err on the side of trusting in that science rather than just my speculations on what potential ecosystemic changes can occur by eradicating particular species. The same for ticks. Um, they don't seem to have a significant role in our ecosystems other than, um, you know, birds eat them to some degree, but they certainly wouldn't starve if, the, if, the, if ticks disappeared. So I think looking at the health problems with the understanding that down the road we could be changing, you change the dynamics of human health and you change population dynamics in certain ways, but as you point out, it's not for me to make those decisions on who gets to live and who gets to die. Certainly people who are suffering and dying from these diseases, I think, have a right to ease their suffering. I also think it's interesting this idea of, and I have to agree with what I read about George Church, the, the, uh, the idea of resurrecting extinct species, given that there's these problems, and I think one of the biggest ethical problems is um, whether the uh, resurrected species have, you know, sort of are deformed in such a way, you can't live, uh, they have lives foreshortened, that seems to be a, a major ethical problem. But beyond that, it's more our fear of the unknown, and but there's also that competes with our curiosity. And I'm one of those people that it would be, I, I'm very curious to see what we can do with life, just accelerating the, the process of evolution in interesting ways. Um, not necessarily deleterious, it could be um, very beneficial. For example, the passenger pigeon. I've read that the passenger pigeon is a predator of ticks, for example, and may have well, uh, you know, controlled the tick population in the past. So it's interesting to think about controlling problems as with climate change, we have, you know, different colonization of insects, a rise in zoonotic diseases and other infectious diseases. What would bringing certain species back do? And I know George Schertz, George also talked about the woolly mammoth having, you know, tamping down snow in the tundra, maybe helping with, um, slowing down, uh, you know, glacial melting or in certain places. So there could be some benefits we just don't know. So rather than make an ethical argument about the dangers of the unknown, I would say there, all, there are also ethical arguments to be made about the possibilities of the unknown, the beneficial possibilities. 
So, so David, I was wondering if you could join us in some of this uh, speculative talk. So, um, you know, how, how do we responsibly enter this terrain of uh, deciding who lives and dies? Um, how, 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 do, how do we uh, a, approach um, a, a technology like the gene drive that has the potential to, to run wild in unpredictable ways? So, if I may, and let, let, let me rephrase that as in who gets to come back from the dead and who do we quite intentionally try to wipe out? Uh, and, and so take those two extremes. So, you know, if, I, and I, I should preface this by saying I've, I've devoted my career basically to trying to find ways to protect species from disappearing, overwhelming preference that they remain in the wild, uh, in ecosystems that have a relatively light uh, imprint from human activities. But the key thing for me is preventing them from going extinct, and I'm certainly not at all opposed to, in extreme cases, uh, bringing species into captivity uh, for the purpose of protecting them when it's clear that they're not going to be able to survive in the wild given the changes in their environment. So how this relates to, say, bringing back the passenger pigeon, my view has been, you know, if, if someone uh, is keen to fund uh, Beth or any other uh, scientist who wants to uh, restore, create a passenger pigeon or a woolly mammoth, I would generally be supportive of it. I, I think it would be marvelous if before I died I got to see a passenger pigeon. Um, on the other hand, if that potential donor were to come to me and say, well, should I give my money to recreate the passenger pigeon or should I give that money to protect some of the remaining forests in Sumatra, hands down I'd say, no, 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 keep, keep protecting the forests in Sumatra, a lot more species will benefit uh, and we will get to see those species in the wild. So as long as the efforts to restore species are by and large additional to and not taking away from efforts for conservation uh, on the land and in the water, I'm supportive of that. Realistically, I don't foresee there ever being a time where any of these species brought back from the dead are going to be uh, filling the skies or the forests the way they once did. I, I suspect in, in many cases, in the case of the passenger pigeon, we simply do not have the uh, forests that would be able to sustain the large flocks. In the case of the woolly mammoth, I'm not sure there are many places around where we could put lots of woolly mammoths out without <laughs> somehow angering, you know, some Clive and Bundy type character. Um, in terms of which ones we kill off, I think that's, that's a trickier challenge. Uh, you know, years ago, uh, when the Carter Foundation was just starting a campaign to eradicate the guinea worm, this absolute ghastly thing that burrows into people, a really revolting creature, uh, he called them, and he was understandably concerned. He said, you know, smallpox, okay, but now the guinea worm, what's next? And I thought to myself, I was working for an environmental group then, do I really want to be on the defense for the guinea worm? Uh, a species that requires human hosts, causes nothing but misery. And my answer was, you know, goodbye, guinea worm. I, I'm not, I'm not going to try to expend any political capital saving that because I just don't think it's a winnable battle. Um, if we go forward and we say, well, can we knock out some of these ghastly diseases by knocking out certain species of mosquitoes, I would say my attitude is proceed with extreme caution. We're going to do it if the technology is there. People are going to want to do it. Um, we ought to try to understand what the consequences are, will be, uh, in the context of the environment as best we can. Uh, I would hope we would proceed carefully with lots of monitoring and that we would always consider if we saw the potential for serious uh, disruptions in the lives of other species. Uh, we would consider fully whether there are other alternatives to achieve our goals of protecting people that would not necessarily wipe out the species. But, but the, the, the belief I had early in my life that, that uh, we should never 
drive anything to extinction has weakened somewhat over time as I've, I've come to accept the fact that we're not going to be able to stop people from at least getting rid of the species that they perceive are a direct health conflict to them. And in turn, we can try to work with the people who perceive species to be a direct threat to them, not because they are making them sick, but because they're, say, raiding their livestock or their crop fields, try to get those people off the idea of wanting to eradicate the species. So, so Maria, I was wondering if uh, I could bring you into the conversation. So a, a lot of your work has orbited around um, taking um, creatures that are sort of on the periphery of, of human society or on the periphery of everyday awareness and, and making them visible, make, making them uh, uh, these, these imperiled organisms palpable to, to people. Could, could you talk about, um, you know, how, how, how extinction plays out in, in your work mm -hmm. and some, some of the challenges that, that we face in, in, in the contemporary era? Well, I think, uh, I mean, in this conversation, it, I was thinking about this piece I have, which is called uh, The Visitor. And I guess if you um, recontextualize it in, uh, for extinction or de-instinction, it makes me think about how, um, what it would be like to actually visit this planet as an outsider. And, um, and if the planet had become uninhabitable, um, how you would then see the planet as something very detached from you. So if you had to wear a spacesuit in order to walk around, what would the planet look like to you in that sense? And so this piece um, is about this traveler that just walks in these different environments and um, starts in Colorado and then ends up um, in Texas uh, at the oil refineries. And so I was thinking about how um, just in, in, in lots of different ways um, how you, you know, what it would feel like to have to be able to create your own environment in order to survive on this planet. So a lot of my work is really about just thinking about how we live in the present, but what the future could look like. Um, and then some of the other work too, um, again, is about it's, it's about oil and, and wildlife and how they coexist. And, you know, looking at the future of oil or thinking about the energy industry and how its impact our environment and, and how, you know, wh or what the future looks like. Um, so in Houston or right outside of Houston towards Galveston are some of the largest oil refineries in the United States and also are some of the largest uh, wetlands so birds migrating from Canada uh, south land in these wetlands that are all around these oil refineries. So it's, in, it's an interesting contrast, and at, at the same time, it's, it's an interesting reality to see this coexistence. Um, so a lot of my work just looks at uh, these relationships and, and how do we think about them, um, and, you know, and how do we think about the future you know, if, if the landscapes we're living in are going to continue to change. So. Graham, I'd like to bring you in. So we don't have a, um, we don't have a ton of time, but I thought um, maybe it would be the right moment to expand back out a little bit to the frame of the exhibition and the course. Um, and to do that, we could circle uh, back around to Carrie's talk and to the work of Michael Pessel uh, uh, about which you spoke. So um, compliments to you, Evan, for having put together such an interesting uh, hour and a half for all of us. And the thing I come out of it kind of with front to mind is the question of the relationship between kind of artistic humanistic and kind of techno-scientific domain specialization that is sort of uh, enacted at an occasion like this. So, you know, a work of art like Michael's that is so deeply steeped in research, which research is 
historical, history of science -y, my own sort of subspecialty or field, also steeped in the sort of contemporary scientific questions that its subject raises, and then kind of stages those performatively, so it isn't a it isn't even a static work, it's a kind of an occasion for certain kinds of collectivities of people doing stuff, making music, performing sort of conjured ritual acts, um, experimenting with memorialization. Um, so it becomes a kind of proliferating occasion for something like performative pedagogy or uh, a process of teaching and learning that's built around objects and situations. Um, and I think for those of us who, who are kind of rooted in the kind of traditional Wissenschaftlichkeit humanities, and I'm, I guess, I'm trying to think, is there anybody else? Yes, I guess maybe James is a yes, continental kind of, kind of philosopher. You're in on that uh, project. For those of us who, who kind of come to this kind of party from that perspective, I think we have a lot of work to do and thinking to do about how the kinds of questions we've um, been accustomed to asking and the techniques that we've brought to uh, answering them need to be set in relation to the kinds of activities that we kind of have heard discussed today in Carrie's talk and to the kind of work that's been so powerfully uh, evoked by, uh, by Beth and by Kevin and others. So for me, that might, you know, I don't know how much time we really have left, but a lot of interesting, quite detailed, specific stuff about super important genetic questions, genetic technologies, um, policy questions. But we're here at a university, a university that kind of barely even fully knows yet what it wants to do with the arts. I mean, so we have, you know, a $300 million arts center, which is in the process of realization. And I think it's worth our kind of bringing in the fact that it is an art installation, art project that has occasioned this gathering, which gathering has functioned pedagogically, also generatively, how research fits in that. These are questions that I think are very much to my mind as I kind of um, finish, finish out listening to you all. So thank you. That's a way of saying thank you. And uh, that's something for all of us, I think, to keep thinking about. Yeah, um, well, it's, I can't tell you how much more interesting this is than my normal field, <laughs> field conference, you know, listening to papers, that, you know, by English department people do their thing. So this is, this has really been fantastic. I wish we, I actually wish we had a whole day to do this, but I don't know, Evan, maybe, maybe we can. Just <laughs> hang out tomorrow. Maybe we can do that. But, I mean, I just wanted to highlight a few things that have, have been put on the table. Um, one of which just came up, which is, uh, and, I, and I, this is why I mentioned in, in talking about Michael's piece, this question of dwelling and, 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 and how dwelling gets um, built into, the question of dwelling gets built into the piece. And there's a long you know, philosophical genealogy of dwelling, but, but I do think this nexus of, of, of what is the eco of ecological thought and, and, the, and the, the meeting place of, of the eco of ecology and the eco of economy on the side of this, its etymological root, oikos, is kind of a good place to start. And I think all of those issues have been in, in play in, in, in the conversation, um, you know, economic motivations and so on, but in biopolitical factors as well. I mean, when I think about ecology, uh, you know, I. I think it can ne these questions can never be divorced from the question of, you know, for whom. So, you know, when we talk about eradicating certain things that we don't like, a very obvious question uh, presents itself, uh, and that's the question of uh, ecological ethnocentrism. You know, there's a long history of eradicating things that we don't like that we could point to uh, as being probably pretty embarrassed about at this point in our human history. Um, and so, and, and this is something I know Eben's been interested in for a long time as well and works a lot on. So this is not to say that making those kinds of decisions are unavoidable. Uh, of course, they're not unavoidable, but it's just to highlight the fact that they're always made in light of, as I put it in my last book, Before the Law, they're made in light of the fact that 
at some point we will discover that we will have been wrong in making those decisions. I mean, think about, if you think, if you think about what we know about non-human creatures now uh, and the complexity of their mental and cognitive and emotional and social lives and so on, um, that we didn't know 150 years ago and the actions we um, quite blithely took on the basis of that, that ignorance and you think about now how that's changed when we think about great apes or we think about elephants or we think about dolphins just to just to mention charismatic megafauna I think one thing that shows us is that the history of science shows us actually that that those lines will continue to move and have moved historically and so whatever decisions we make, I think a lot of what's been said here reminds me that those decisions are made in a situation of the knowledge that at some point we will have been wrong and we have to make those decisions inescapably, but also kind of under erasure, <laughs> if you will. Um, the other thing I just wanted to put on the table that hasn't come up, but for me is a really related and important context, is it reminds me actually of a lot of debates that um, really don't come up in these conversations so much, but maybe do in the work of some of the panelists, to go back to the 60s and 70s um, uh, around questions of what was then called deep ecology, uh, and, and which then was a very vital um, question in environmental ethnic ethics, and the question of biocentrism, which was related to that. Because, you know, if you want to, from a non, you know, you know, anthropocentric point of view, if you want to start talking about eradicating things that are bad for life, um, Dave Foreman, who was the founder of, of the radical environmental group Earth First, would say, well, you should start with Homo sapiens. Uh, and, you know, there were people, including Dave Foreman, who said, well, you know, actually a 70% die-off of the human population actually wouldn't be a bad thing for the planet if we're not talking about just, like, what we like and what's good for us. But then the biopolitical point that's been raised, which is a very important one, is then you immediately have to ask, well, what are the people going to look like who are going to do most of the dying? And they're going to be people living to the south of us who are poorer than us with darker skins than ours, probably. And so, and so these questions of, of how to deal with eth ethnocentrism and anthropocentrism and the biopolitical questions involved in thinking these ecological questions from a standpoint that doesn't just take for granted the fact that, well, we like certain things and don't like others, and let's just optimize our own, you know, existence in what Richard, Ro Richard Rorty called the, the, rich North, the rich North Atlantic bourgeois democracies, <laughs> unabashedly. You know, if we want to move beyond that in dealing with these questions, then I think, you know, reaching back to these conversations that took place in the 60s and 70s in North America around deep ecology and biocentrism are actually really a worthwhile thing to do, and I haven't seen them come up a whole lot in the in the discussions around uh, CRISPR and de-extinction and so on, but, but I think they should. So that's, that's a way of kind of trying to tie together uh, the final comment we had from Graham and some of what the, what the panelists have discussed today. So some of the artworks here are rendering visible ongoing ecological catastrophes that might or might not be stemmed. Uh, there's gonna be a video uh, appearing up above your heads as we close here of gold mining in the Amazon and blasted landscapes in West Papua that have been clear cut. These, this, this ongoing destruction might not be stopped. Um, there's other artwork in here that illustrates practices of care that might keep those in the world that we love. Um, uh, really difficult practices of care. For example, Laura McLaughlin's illustrations of uh, people who care for hedgehogs in the UK. She, she shows um, some, some of the uh, processes that are leading to their death and destruction, but also how people are, are making these tactful proposals and loving gestures to, to those that they love. She also illustrates how they're going wild in, in her own home of New Zealand. Um, eating other kinds of endangered life, even even as this animal, which is endangered in the UK, is in flour is flourishing in a new environment. Um, so, so I invite you to wander around the gallery. I, I think rather than continue the formal part of the conversation, we'll wrap this up. So, please uh, have have dialogue with with the panelists. Uh, there's lots of food in the back. Um, I'd like to thank you, Kevin and Beth, for for joining, and and for all the panelists who are here.